Hey there, it's John Baugh again uh, for another uh, lecture. Uh, we're on lecture 13 now, and uh, we are going to cover some uh, aspects of GUI. Even though it doesn't have to do with any of the assignments you get for this class, it's very important that you know a little bit about GUI uh, besides the uh, J options pane and uh, stuff like that that we've dealt with before. Uh, we want to be able to make uh, custom GUI applications in Java, not just console applications. Um, so we're going to look at some of that today. So the Capstone project is due next week. Um, it's due on the uh, 21st, or the week of the 21st. It's due on April 25th, which is a Friday at 11.50 p.m. Um, I think that should be 59. That's fine. Um, obviously, I'm not going to uh, wait there at 11.50 and then scald anyone who... Uh, scold anyone who uh, turns it in a little bit late. Um, but anyway, you should probably uh, be at least in the midst of working on it. Hopefully, you're, many of you are done, I think. Um, but just you know, keep working on it and uh, keep reading up and asking questions if you have any uh, problems. All right, so let's uh, jump into it today. We've got Chapter 12, a first look at GUI applications. And it's uh, kind of a big... Uh, chapter, so we will be doing a little bit more of it in the next lecture um, as well. Uh, it's a very large chapter, actually. Uh, I think you probably should have broken it up a little bit further, but um, regardless, uh, Chapter 12 discusses the following main topics. So we've got an introduction, how to create windows, equipping GUI classes with the main method, layout managers. Um, we'll cover up to layout managers this week. Um, then we'll do radio buttons and checkboxes, borders, focus on problem solving. Uh, we may or may not do that one. Um, we've also uh, got, uh, uh, they've got the extensions of the J panel, but there's also a couple other things later after the uh, radio uh, buttons and checkboxes. There's also uh, borders, um, which is potentially useful. Uh, we might cover splash screens. Uh, using console output to debug the GUI application on common errors to avoid as well. So, All right, so uh, many job applications use a graphical user interface or a GUI. A GUI is a graphical window or windows that provide interaction with the user. GUIs accept input typically from the keyboard and the mouse. Uh, you can also have input from a um, uh, touch screen and things like that as well, so it isn't necessarily limited to that. But a window in a GUI consists of components that present data to the user and allow interactions with the application. So GUIs are actually very important, and they have uh, made it possible for, um, you know, average everyday people who aren't computer scientists and mathematicians to deal with computers. Because uh, console uh, interaction is not the most um, effective. Well, it's very effective, but it's not the most uh, user-friendly uh, type of interaction you can have with the computer. So a lot of people are not interested in that. Okay, but since we have GUIs now, um, it allows uh, people to interact with applications a lot more effectively for them. Um, people like visual things. So some common GUI components are you have buttons, uh, which we're pretty familiar with, like the close button here, labels, which just display text, text fields, which where you could put uh, a line of text, uh, check boxes uh, like this over here, where you can check the checkbox or uncheck it, and then radio buttons where you can have a mutually exclusive list and select one of uh, several. Uh, combo boxes like the drop down here, and then a slider. Um, the Java Foundation classes, uh, AWT and Swing. So Java programmers use the JFC or Java Foundation classes to create GUI applications. The uh, JFC consists of several sets of classes, many of which are beyond the scope of the book. However, there are two sets of the JFC that we'll focus on. Primarily, we'll focus on Swing, uh, but there's also the Abstract Windowing Toolkit, AWT. So Java's equipped, uh, Java is equipped with a set of classes for drawing graphics and creating graphical user interfaces. Uh, these classes are part of the Abstract Windowing Toolkit. The AWT allows creation of applications and applets with GUI components. The AWP does not actually draw these user interface components on the screen. What it does is it 
uh, communicates with a layer of software uh, called peer classes. Um, each version of Java on a particular operating system has its own set of peer classes. So um, Windows would have its set of peer classes. Um, uh, Mac uh, OS would have its set. Um, other uh, operating system, Linux, different Linux uh, builds and such, they have their own set of uh, peer classes. And basically, AWT tells it, hey, show a button here. So it will look native. Um, Java programs using the AWT look consistent with other applications on the same system. So you might not be able to tell it's written in Java. Um, they can offer only components that are common to all the operating systems that support Java. Uh, because um, if we had a special type of user interface component on a Mac that is not available on Windows, then it wouldn't make much sense to put it into this AWT uh, because uh, Java wants things to be as platform independent as possible. Um, so the uh, behavior of the components across the various operating systems can differ. So not only do we have different components, but you also have um, different behaviors. Programmers cannot easily extend the AWT components, so it's, it's kind of inflexible in a lot of ways. So uh, we generally refer to AWT components as heavyweight components. Uh, in addition to AWT, we have something called Swing. Uh, Swing was introduced uh, with the release of Java 2. Uh, Swing is a library of classes that provide, it, provide an improved alternative for creating GUI applications and applets. So very few of these Swing classes rely on peer classes, so they're not reliant on the, uh, the um, uh, classes that can produce the native uh, buttons and things like that. So we generally call Swing classes uh, lightweight components. Swing draws most of its own components rather than allowing, uh, having the operating system or requesting the, operating, the host operating system to do it for it. So Swing components have a consistent look and predictable behavior on any operating system. And Swing components can be easily extended. So programs that operate in a GUI environment must be what we call event-driven. Okay, event-driven uh, means that they are not surprisingly driven by events. Um, instead of just um, uh, printing out to the console saying, please enter your name, and then you interact, and then it interacts with you, maybe asks for something else, please enter something else, and then you enter something else, and it responds. That's how console works. It's kind of in a sequential way most of the time. But GUI is event-driven. The event is an action that takes place within a program, such as a very common event. Very common is clicking a button. Part of writing a GUI application is creating the event listeners. Okay, in some applications or in some uh, programming environments, we call these the event handlers. An event listener, uh, well, kind of. The event handler is more of the method, but an event listener is a special object that automatically executes one of its methods. These would be the uh, these would be what actually handle the event uh, when a specific event occurs. Okay, so you've got the JavaX dot swing and java.awt. This is not a typo. There is an X here. Um, in an application that uses swing, you have to use the java extended dot swing li library. You can include all the packages or import the packages there. Um, some of the AWT classes are used to determine uh, when events such as clicking the mouse take place in applications. So in an application that uses AWT class, it's necessary to import java.awt.start. Note there's no X here, and there is an X there. So how do we create a window? How do we create a window? Um, often applications need one or more windows with various components. A window is a container, which uh, is simply a component that holds other components. That's all a container is. But since it's a container and it can be displayed as a window, so it's a visual component in and of itself, and it's a container, it's called a frame. Okay. That's what we call them in Java um, and in other uh, paradigms as well. But in a Swing application, you can create a frame from a class named JFrame. A frame is a basic window that has a border around it, a title bar. That's where you put, like, this is my app or my app or uh, PowerPoint or whatever you're creating. Don't create PowerPoint because it's already been done. Um, a set of buttons for minimizing, maximizing, and closing the window. These standard features are sometimes referred to as the Windows decorations. So this is what a basic um, window would look like in Java. We can uh, create, I've already got my project here, I'm going to create 
a file here. I'm going to create a class. We're going to call it uh, show window. And we'll put it in the, the term dot uh, aircraft JP bar. JP bar dot lecture 13. Oops, I put 12. We'll put, uh, change the name here. Defector name. It doesn't really matter, but okay. So this is what we have here. We'll have public static void main. There's one way to do it. We'll see a different way to do it. I'll do a blue better way to do it in just a moment. And then you're going to um, make use of the swing classes. So that means that we have to import up here. We want to import javax.swing.start. Okay. So we've got the swing uh, swing library imported. Let's say final here. Window width is equal to 350. We'll make it 350 pixels wide. And the window height equals uh, 250. Let's make it 250 high. So we'll create a window. This is how you create a window. Remember, the window is a container, uh, but it's also a visual component. So JFrame window equals new JFrame. Right. So we created JFrame window. Which is the name of the jQuery we just created. We're going to do that set title. I'm going to set it to a simple window. And then you're going to say window dot set size. And you're going to pass it window width, window height. Then uh, you're going to set the default closes operation. And this will be jframe.exit on close. All right. So that's a that's an operation. Uh, by default, it'll actually um, close the visual component, but it will actually not remove it from memory. So creating the uh, frame itself does not make it visible. Does not make the frame visible. The window. Um, in order to do that, we have to call the set visible. So we'll say window dot set visible. And pass it true. That actually makes the window visible. Let's run it and see what happens. And here's our window right here. All right, pretty simple. Doesn't really do anything. Just a basic window. Doesn't have really anything attached to it. Um, it does have the title bar that we added and uh, minimize, maximize, and it is um, 350 pixels wide and 250 tall. So far, so good. So. Um, Okay, already went over that pretty much. So, um, usually though, you don't create a JFrame directly. Uh, usually, you don't do that. Usually, you're going to um, extend the JFrame class. So that's what we're going to do in the next example. Um, so um, the first thing. Or when a new class extends an existing class, like we uh, spoke of when we discussed inheritance, it inherits many of the existing class's members just as they, just as if they were part of the new class. These members act just as if they were written into the new class declaration. New fields and methods can be added to the new class. That's why we call it extending, because it has at least what the parent class has. This allows specialized methods and fields to be added to your window. So let's work with that a little bit. We're going to create two new classes. Uh, one of them is going to extend, extend JFrame, and the other one is going to make use of it. So uh, we're getting better uh, in the way we're handling our GUI environment. So creating a JFrame by itself, we generally don't initialize it or instantiate it that way. We're going to create one class um, called simplewindow.java. Oops, simple window. And um, that's good. It does not have a public uh, static void main. And then you're going to have a simple window demo.java. So I'm going to create another one. New class. I'll call this one simple window demo. All right, let's go to simple window first. This is the one that's actually going to, to um, uh, make use of and extend the JFrame. So I'm going to say import javax.swing.star. And then I'm going to say simple window extends. JFrame. 
All right, so we're basically uh, utilizing inheritance here, which we've discussed before. I'm going to say final int window width equals 350. Final int window height equals 250. And then we're going to have the um, um, oops, one second. I looked at something wrong. Okay, there we go. Um, that actually should be inside of a constructor. Sorry about that. So we have the constructor, which is public simple window, and then we uh, create the window width and window height, just like we had before. And it's called set title. Now notice we're doing essentially the same thing we did before, but notice I do not use any kind of name of an object and then dot set title. I don't need to. Because since simple window extends JFrame, this one actually can call these methods directly as if they were its own, because they are. They're inherited. Set size to window width and window height. Set default uh, close operation, jframe.exit on close, and then display. So we're going to say set visible true. All right, so this does this is exactly the same as what we did in our show window example, but this time we've separated out this jframe. We've created our window here, and in simple window uh, demo, we, this is where we have to uh, the main method. Okay, so public static void main. Now we could, um, if we wanted to, we could just say simple window, uh, my window equals new simple window. All right, and then if I run it, notice it shows the simple window here. Um, you have another option. You could um, instantiate the class anonymously here, and you don't actually have to create, since we're never using this variable again once we create it, you could just do this. Now, that looks kind of silly to us, but that's called instantiating the class anonymously, and it does exactly the same thing. Okay, so that's actually it's sometimes a preferred method if you're not doing anything with the variable. We don't need to capture the variable anywhere. Uh, so as soon as you say new simple window, all it does is it brings that into memory and causes it to display. All right, so uh, pretty useful. All right. Um, you can equip GUI classes with a main method also. So you're not limited to creating, you know, one GUI class and then um, creating the class that's going to use it or the, what we would call the driver or the client of the code. Um, you can actually create the GUI class and then also add a main method to it. So the previous example had the two separate files. Applications can be written with the main method directly into it. So we're going to write embedded main.java. Let's make create a new uh, source file here. Oops, that's an interface. Embedded main. All right. So we've got embedded main, main here. Final and window width. 350. Um, also, we need to include a uh, swing and extend it. So import uh, javax.swing.star and then embedded main extends jframe. So far, so good. Public embedded main. Alright, so we have again. Everything we did before. So actually, I'm just going to go over here. I'm going to borrow it because I'm going to be cheap about it. Uh, do that. There we go. And we're going to put it in there. It's the exact same crap that we had in before. All right, embedded main. But then we're going to have main actually be part of this class. So public static void main string args, and then I'm going to say new embedded main. You could alternatively say embedded main, um, BM is just an embedded main, or whatever name you'd like, you can do that alternatively. But this is called anonymous um, instantiation. Alright, let's 
run it, see if it works. And it does. We get the exact same thing as we had before. Okay. So that's three different ways to do it. Um, often the um, uh, type you're going to see is with main embedded. Um, some people don't like it. Some people do. Uh, but it's it's very common to have a main method inside of the main or the primary uh, GUI class. So. Um, now we've uh, figured out how to make the window, but how do we add components? So now we're interested in adding the components. So Swing provides numerous components that can be added to a window. Three fundamental components are the JLabel, JText field, and JButton. So we, we saw those earlier in the, in the small example. Um, an area that displays text is the JLabel. So basically that is not used for user input typically. Um, an area in which the user may type a single line of input is the JText field. And then JButton is a button that can cause an action to occur when it's clicked. All right. So here's a sketch of our uh, kilometer converter. Maybe we want to make a kilometer converter. And um, let's just say that we have a window title. We have a label. Um, and we also have a uh, text field and a button. So adding components to this, you have private JLabel message, private JText field kilometers, private JButton calc button. You'll notice these are all classes. Okay, and then these are all the objects of the classes. And then later on you instantiate them by doing something like this. Message equals, so message is the label. You say it's new JLabel. And then you put the text of the label in here. You create the text field. And then you say kilometers equals new J text field of size 10. Now, what does the size mean here? Well, it's technically, um, in the comments in the book, they say 10 characters wide, which is uh, technically true. But um, uh, it's, it's more accurately um, 10, what they, is called columns wide. And a column is as large as the largest letter in the alphabet, the widest letter in the alphabet, and that just happens to be an M. Okay, so we'll say it's the, wide, the width of 10 M's. Uh, the calc button, say calc button equals new J button, and then uh, give it the, the um, text right here, calculate. So that code declares and instantiates three swing components. <clears throat> a content pane is a container that is part of every JFrame object. So every time you create a JFrame, it has a content pane in it. Every component added to the JFrame must be added to its content pane. So, so far we've just created the JFrame, we haven't added anything to it. But we do this using the JFrame classes add method. The content pane is not visible itself and it does not have a border. A panel, this is another uh, type here, a panel is a container that can hold GUI components. Panels cannot be displayed by themselves. Panels are commonly used to hold and organize collections of related uh, components. You can create panels with the JPanel class. So if I wanted to, I can create another variable, private JPanel, name it panel. You have to instantiate it first, and then you can call its add method to add, you know, the button, the uh, uh, text field, and the, or I'm sorry, the uh, label, the text field, and the button. All right. So Components are typically placed on a panel, and then the panel is added to the JFrame's content pane. So let's take a look um, at what this is going to uh, uh, what this is going to be like um, in the Kilo Converter. So let's create that. I'm going to close all these other classes here, and we're going to create a Kilo Converter here. Class, I'm going to call it Kilo Converter. All right, inside here. A um, couple things I need to worry about. Import um, devx.sway.star. Then Kilo Converter is going to extend JFrame. So it's extend JFrame. Inside of here, we're going to say private JPanel panel. Private JLabel uh, message label. Private JText field. Um, Kilo text field, private J button, calc button, and then you have the, the uh, constants here, final int, window width equals 310, and 
private final is window height equals 100. All right, so we've got our, our data that we need. We're going to create the constructor. All right. So part of this is it's going to set the title to kilom kilometer converter. All right. Then it's going to set the size. No, no surprise here. Window width. Window height. Then specify what happens when the close occurs. So we've seen this before, right? Looks pretty. Uh, set default close operation looks pretty um, familiar. Exit on close. All right. So so far so good. Then we're going to actually create a method called build panel. We call build panel. All right. And we're going to call. Let me take care of it in a second. We're going to call build panel here, and then we're going to add the panel to our J frame. Now, remember, notice that add does not have uh, any dot in front of it because we're talking about the method that belongs to J frame. So we're adding our panel, um, which we're going to create in build panel. It's global, so we have access to it. It's globally available within Java or within uh, this method. And then you're going to say set visible to true. Now, we didn't have to break build panel off into a separate method, but we did because it will keep things a lot more clear. It's a very common thing to do. So message, inside of build panel, we have message label equals new J label. We'll say enter a distance in KM. All right. And then, so for kilometers. And then you're going to say um, kilo text field equals new J text field of size 10. All right. And then you're going to say calc button equals new J button. Put calculate on it. And you might be thinking, well, where did all these names come from? Message label, kilo text field, calc button. Oh, yeah, that's right. We used them up here. Okay. So we declared them up here and we're actually instantiating them in build panel, which is in turn called by uh, kilo or uh, kilo converters automatically called when you create this kilo converter and then in turn it calls build panel and then this calls all of these so once you've done that you can create a j panel object uh, so you're going to say panel equals new j panel and then add the components so you're going to say now remember this is a different add up here this um, we build the panel here, and then we add the panel to the J-frame. So the J-frame just adds it as its only component, and the panel itself has the um, has the button, the message label, and the text field inside of it. So it's a panel dot add message label panel dot add kilo text field panel dot add uh, calc button. All right, so, so far, what we have here um, is a panel that we've created, and we've added these, uh, the label, the text field, and the button in order here, and then um, we're missing one last thing. In order to actually make this whole thing come to life, uh, we have to have main instantiated at some point, so we're just going to include main here. Public static void main, and we're going to say new kilo converter. Actually, this is anonymously instantiating it. All right, so here we go. Excellent. So it's allowing us to, we're not doing anything yet with the button. The button doesn't do anything. I can add whatever I want, and it's not going to do anything because there's no um, event listeners, event handlers associated here. But we do see that we don't. Uh, we're not limited to the very, very basic and simple um, J-frame. So um, the next thing we're going to look at um, is how to handle the event action. So what happens when we actually click that button? What happens when uh, anything happens as far as the user interacting? Um, an event is an action that takes place within a program such as the clicking of the button. When an event takes place, the component um, that is responsible for the event 
uh, creates an event object in memory. So this event object is created. The event object contains information about the event itself. So the component that generated the event is called the event source. Okay. It's possible that the source component is connected to one or more event listeners. An event listener is an object that responds to events. The source component uh, fires an event which is passed to the method to a method in the event listener. Okay, the methods are I would call I typically call them event handlers. Event listener classes are specific to each application. Event listener classes are also commonly written as private inner classes in an application. So here's an example. Um, a class that's defined inside of another class is known as an inner class. Java allows this. You can have your outer class, that could be your main primary class you're dealing with. Then you usually have a private inner class uh, or many private inner classes um, in order to uh, uh, do various things. But uh, event listeners, for example, are commonly written as these private inner classes. In order for an event listener to be an event listener, or for this class or class to be an event listener, the event listener class has to implement an interface. An interface is something like a class containing one or more method headers. We talked about it before, I believe in chapter uh, 10. When you write a class that implements an interface, you're agreeing. You're basically making a contract with the class, uh, between the class and the interface, and saying that this class will have all of the methods that are specified in the interface. So let's consider J button. J button is our um, button that we created a second ago. Right here, it's our J button. And um, these require an action listener because they generate um, action events. Action listener classes must meet the following requirements. It must implement the action listener interface and it must have a method named action perform. Now that's the key right there since you implement that interface um, you're basically saying that uh, you're going to implement the action performed um, method. So the action performed method takes an argument of the action event type. So this is a specific event. This is the event right here. E is its name. And then you put code of what happens when this button is pressed. Here's how it kind of works here. You've got the J button component here. Um, when it's pressed, it generates an event object. So it creates an event object, for example, the action listener object, or I'm sorry, the uh, action event object. And then the, this event object is the parameter action event E here. And then the action listener, which is an object, does something based on that event. It's actually very well designed if you think about it. You've got the generator or the source of the event. So what caused the event? Um, the event itself, it's a separate object. These are two separate objects. This is really an object here, but J button is an object. Um, the event itself, which is a separate object, and then a separate object, which takes that event as input and does something based on that event. So it's very well designed. Three different objects um, are uh, involved here. So uh, if we go back um, to our Kilo converter here, um, uh, we should be able to uh, update it here. So one of the things we need to update it is in order to handle events, we have to import java.awt.event. Right? Java.awt, uh, oops, dot event dot star. Okay, yep, all right. That's needed in order for us to utilize the action listener interface. So we're not adding any more data, really. What we're going to do, though, in the build panel, after we, um, oh, let me look here, uh, calc button. We're going to create a private class, an inner class inside of here, um, called um, calc button listener. I guess we'll leave main at the bottom still. And we're going to put main here so we can keep track of where it is. I'm going to create a private inner class. Uh, for event listening. So it's going to be private class calc button uh, listener implements action listener. Now you notice 
it's underlining it still. If I hover over it, it'll say that it must implement the inherited abstract method uh, action performed. So you can tell it to add unimplemented methods if you want. And it automatically um, adds it here. All right, so that's pretty much what we expected. Uh, you don't technically do that. Um, so what we've got here is the CalcBot listener, and it implements the action listener. Up here in the build panel, which is in our primary class, um, after you create the button, let's add the uh, event listener. So you have to say calc button. This is where you associate them. This is where you say, if the button's pressed, what do I do? Well, in this case, you're going to say new calc uh, button listener. All right, so we've associated the button with the listener down here. Now, the vast majority of the code that we're interested in is in action performed. So we're going to create a constant. Um, I'm going to delete the uh, little comment there. Oops. I'm going to do final double conversion um, equals 0 0.6214. That's a conversion uh, conversion value between the miles and kilometers. String input, uh, double miles. And then let's get the text um, entered by the user in the text field. You're just going to say input equals kilo text field dot get text. So all that does is it pulls the text out of the text field. Okay, it takes the text. It has to be a string because that's what it is. It is a string. Um, but once we get that, we have to do something here. Um, you've got to actually convert the input um, that's uh, brought in uh, from the text field. So we could use another variable. Um, we could say uh, doubles input here. But we're going to do the computation all at once. So I'm going to calculate the miles from the given kilometers. I say miles equals uh, double dot parse double. And I'm going to pass it the input that we got in. Then multiply that whole thing by the conversion ratio. So you'll notice that uh, we are using something we've seen before here, the double dot parse double. Remember, if you have a text input, even if you're uh, inputting it from the console, if they input data there, um, you have to parse it before you can use it as a double. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, we just didn't use an intermediate variable for it. You would just convert it to a double right away and then multiply it by the conversion. And we've got the number of, of uh, miles. So then you're going to display the result. Right. There's a J option show message dialog. And no, and then input. Uh, KM is miles. good. Uh, so far so good. And then you've got uh, main still doing its uh, business down here. This whole thing looks the same. But in this case, what we're going to do is let's put uh, 100 kilometers. It's going to tell us 100 kilometers is this many miles. Okay, so we're going to say, let's say 56 kilometers is 34 point da -da -da miles. All right. And you can use a bunch of other things like the decimal formatter to, um, you know, reduce the number of decimal places and things like that. So. All right. We registered the listener. Um, another thing you can do um, is you can do uh, foreground and background colors. So if you're interested in uh, doing colors, um, then you do have the option to do that. Uh, many of the swing components have methods named set background and set foreground. So set background is used to change the color of a component itself. Set foreground is used to change the color of the text. Each method takes a, tech, a color constant as its argument. So these are the predefined constants that you, you can use these for colors. Um, they have an example called color window. Um, but let me see here, panel dot set background. Let's just change the color in our example that we have already. So I'm going to say panel dot set background. And we're going to say color dot red. Um, there you go. Good. Um, it might need to import another thing in here. Uh, what is the problem? Import color. Okay. Oh, I thought I had it. Oh, no, I don't have AWT. That's right. 
Okay, so AWT, you have to import uh, java.awt.color, or you can just import everything um, as part of that. But we're going to set it to red, and you can also set the foreground. So we'll say panel. Uh, you know what? Actually, let's do this. Let's see. Let's make that black. All right. And then panel dot set foreground. We're going to say color dot uh, white. All right. And it's kind of hard to see the other text, so we're going to change something else. Um, let's say that the uh, I don't know what it's. Okay, so black. Let's make it a different color. That doesn't seem right. Yeah, because the other components are. It's kind of overshadowing the other components. So we got red here. All right, that's a little better. You can see it better now. Okay, so you've got uh, enter a distance and kilometer. That's part of the label, not the panel. That's why the white didn't affect it. Um, you can, should be able to take, um, let's see down here, the, and let's do uh, J text, or the button, calc button dot um, set, oops, calc button dot um, set background. We'll make this one color dot uh, blue, and uh, blue's bad. Just a bad idea. Orange. Let's see if that works. There we go. So now we got a really colorful interface. So you can you can play around with those and see what you want to do with that. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, event objects contain certain information about the event. This information can be attained by calling one of the events object event objects methods. There are two of these methods: get source and get action command. Um, so if you use get source, it returns a reference to the object that generated the event. If you uh, get action command, um, then it will um, it will uh, return the action command for the event as a string. Now the action command is basically just like for example on the button. If you had the button named button one, that would be the action command for that. Now. Uh, get source is a reference to the object that generated the event. So you can actually say, um, in here, for example, I could say if um, the event uh, action listener, right here we have the uh, action event here, if I say e.getSource equals um, calc button, then it will uh, do something special. You can also uh, use this if you want to associate many different buttons with the same uh, action listener. You can do that, and then you could distinguish between them using the get source um, and get action command. Um, another thing, last topic of the day is uh, layout managers. This is uh, section 12.3. Uh, layout manager, these are an important part of designing a GUI application. Um, you want to put them in a layout. So the term layout refers to the positioning and sizing component. So layout is positioning and sizing. In Java, you do not normally specify the exact location of a component within a window. A layout manager is an object that controls the position and size of the components and makes adjustments where necessary. The layout manager object and container work together. Java provides several layout managers. There's the flow layout. This is the default for panels. Okay, So basically, it ranges them in rows, and when you get to the end of the size of the panel, it flows into the next row. It starts in the next row. Border layout arranges components in five regions. You have north, south, east, west, and center. And then grid layout. Oh, also, this is the default uh, for JFrame as border layout. And grid layout arranges components in a grid with rows and columns. All right, so uh, the container class is one of the base classes that many components are derived from. Any component that's derived from container class can have a layout manager added to it. Um, you add a layout manager to the container by calling set layout. So if I have a panel here and then I call set layout, I can actually pass it, for example, new border layout, and it will create this panel with border layout. In a JFrame, for example, you might also use this call set layout, new flow layout. So the methods work the same even for the different objects, but you can apply a different uh, layout. Flow layout's the default for JPanel objects. Components appear horizontally from left to right in the order they were added. There's, if there's, or when there's no more room uh, in a row, the next components flow into the next row. All right. They also allow you to align the components. 
So you can put them in the center of each row along the left or right edges using floor layout.center left or right. So for example, when you create the layout or set the layout, you can in the constructor here pass flow layout.left if you want everything to be left aligned. It inserts a gap of five pixels between components horizontally and vertically. You can change this. There's an overloaded constructor. You could pass it uh, the alignment. First of all, that's the first thing. Um, there's an overloaded constructor, which takes two more. It's the horizontal gap. So you want the horizontal gap to be 10 pixels and the vertical gap to be seven. All right, border layout looks like this. Not surprising, center, north, west, south, east. Um, and the component placed in the container is managed by the border layout. It must be placed into one of the five regions. All right, so you say, when you say add button, you have to tell it, I want to put that in the north section, for example. Um, normally, the size of a button is just large enough to accommodate the text that it displays. The buttons displayed in border layout, a layout region, will not retain their normal size. Uh, the components are stretched to fill all the space in their region. All right. The user resizes the window, the sizes of all the components will change as well, so it follows along. Um, if you want to put gaps, um, you can do the same uh, similar thing to what we did before. You pass it two numbers. Um, and uh, nesting layouts. Um, yeah, nesting. nesting. Um, adding components to panels and then nesting the panels inside the regions can overcome the single component limitation of layout regions. So if you add buttons to a J panel and then add the J panel to a region, sophisticated layouts can be achieved very, uh, fairly easily. All right, you've got the grid layout. Uh, grid layout, not surprisingly, puts everything in a grid. Um, it creates a grid with rows and columns, much like a spreadsheet. Um, container is managed by a grid layout object and is divided into equally sized cells. It follows some simple rules. Each cell can hold only one component. All of the cells are the size of the largest component, and a component that is placed in a cell is automatically resized. You pass the number of rows and columns to the constructor. So two and three, for example. A zero can be passed for one of the arguments, but not both. Passing zero for both arguments will cause an illegal argument exception. Oops. All right. And, and then we're, we're done because we're not starting on uh, radio buttons just yet. Okay. We left off on slide 53. All right. So that's, that gives you an idea of how you can uh, deal with some of this stuff um, involved with GUI. There's a lot, to, a lot involved with GUI and tons of stuff that isn't even covered in the book. Uh, but it gives you a start. So... Hopefully that was useful. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to email me and keep working on your, uh, concentrate on your uh, capstone project, of course. But uh, definitely these are good things to know uh, going forward. Um, so when you get into Java 2 or expand your Java knowledge, these are things that you probably want to be aware of. So, all right, thank you and have a great day.